After reflecting on the last five decades, I've come to realize that I have a story. One of my music and my sound, and the marvelous collaborations with friends and colleagues. With a little help from these friends, I will share with you the journey that has shaped my musical life. I suppose every musician has a story, and my story is not new, but it is mine. Welcome to The Path Taken, hosted by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. From the Songsmith album, Tom Farley featuring Todd Gallagher, 69 Pimp Mobile.
here with a, an incredibly old and, and special friend, uh, Todd Gallagher. We go back a long, long ways, uh, 40 years or more. And we're just going to kind of, you know, I guess you could say, recall a lot of the recording and playing history that we've had, which is, is different in a lot of ways from what the way most people actually approached it over time. Uh, we've had uh, several different studio situations with his brother, Steve, who is, uh, we've already had a, uh, uh, I guess you could say, a, a, our, our, our session with Stevie. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's a special place and a special kind of music that we had uh, with Todd that I think really uh, uh, needs to be known because a lot of the stuff that we did never became truly, I guess you could say, professionally published. But we worked up a catalog of songs that were just absolutely amazing. So I'm really glad to have you here today, man. Uh, happy to be here, Tom. Uh, how's the banjo going? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's going pretty good, but... The banjo is a bear, to, uh, as far as comfort goes. It's, yeah. it's like having a bowling ball in your lap. <laughs> it, it, the, my, my banjo weighs 12 and a half pounds. Damn. So, you, it, you, yeah, it's like a bowling ball. And it's round, and it's all concentrated in one little spot. So even if you sit down, you have to strap it on. And, uh, you know, I'm not used to that. I, you know, guitar is so, so comfortable. So you know. it's a five-string, right? Yeah, yeah. What brand is it? It, uh, Washburn. Washburn? Yeah. yeah. It's called a B-17. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, Todd's uh, taking on a new instrument with the, with the banjo, but I can tell you we have a long history of, of acoustic and electric instruments that goes back a long way. Um, I'm going to start us off by, by taking uh, take us back to a place where we were, the, uh, the place at Oceana, which I think a, a lot of our music uh, that me and you and Steve did that was just ours uh, really started. Um, I was, uh, CD had his, uh, his 12 string and his 6 string, but I also uh, had an ES-335, which I loved, and you had the ES-175 and a Les Paul, right. and CD had his Wurlitzer and his Arp Omni, so that's, that was our arsenal. So um, uh, I like to look at that as the beginning of our jazz bow days, <laughs> I mean, because, you know, I, I never, ever really got into... Uh, development of really, uh, I guess you could say, highly complex chords and, and fingerings and stuff like that, except during that period. So, um, you know, what exactly got you on that track? I mean, you know, that was that was a big part of what you were playing for the longest time. Yeah, well, I started listening to Wes Montgomery, and um, and then from there, uh, Joe Pass, and and of course George Benson became real popular oh, at yeah. that time, and uh, that was. Why I got that 175? Uh, as a matter of fact, I didn't have the the Les Paul was a Les Paul Junior. Okay, and uh, it was a really sweet guitar. But I, like an idiot, I traded that to get the the 175. And uh, ouch, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I I've sold two guitars in my life and uh, regretted both of them, and uh, that's why I have you know like twelve guitars now. So well, yeah, I mean, yeah, but those you got some <laughs> nice stuff. I mean, yeah, let, let's let's catalog it. So what do you got as far as your electrics are concerned? Uh, I have three Tom Andersons. You know, one's like a, a Telecaster called yeah. a Hollow T. Uh, one's like a Strat. It's they call it a, a drop top. And then I have uh, one that's kind of like a Les Paul body um, called a Cobra. And, uh, you know, Tom Anderson makes excellent guitars. And, uh, uh, you know, once I bought one, I had to have another. <laughs> Tom, Tom refers to me politely as a guitar slut. Yeah, and, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never met a guitar I didn't fall in love with, so... No, you and Bob Smith are the same way. He, yeah. he, you know, he, he's finding it really hard to to keep his numbers down as far as instruments are concerned. You always have some great acoustics. Yeah, I have a, a Santa Cruz a FTC. It's like a cutaway um, arched. It has an arched back on it, which is unusual. Uh, and light as a feather. Yeah, it, my God. They made the whole thing out of maple. Yeah, so uh, the top and the sides and the back are all maple. Uh, no, I'm sorry. The top is spruce, but the sides and the back are, are maple. Uh, and then I uh, have the uh, a Taylor. Um, I can't remember the model number of it, but <clears throat> it's a smaller guitar with the uh, 12th fret joins the body at the 12th fret, where yeah. most of the acoustics now that they, they they join the body at the 14th fret. It makes makes the guitar a little bit more smaller to hold and uh, 
puts the bridge f- further back in the fat part of the guitar. So it it's got, got a unique sound. It's it's not real loud, but it's it's very clear. Uh, then I have I have four different nylon string guitars. Um, a Harati uh, classic, standard mm-hmm. classic yeah. guitar. And I have a Chet Atkins uh, classic, which is a, like a semi-hollow body guitar. Uh, but it's a full classic neck. And then I have another solid body uh, Chet Atkins uh, nylon string. That's what I, I like that one yeah. the best. Yeah, he used that quite a bit, quite a few of his recordings. And then I have a carving uh, semi hollow body uh, nylon string. Yeah. And you got your banjo. And I got my banjo, and I do have a ukulele too. <laughs> what would what, what, you get with what, what model of the ukulele? Can you remember? You know what? It's it's like a famous Hawaiian brand, but I, it's the, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Uh, but it's it's you know it's a well known Hawaiian brand. It's so, so let me ask you this: I, all the instruments I've been around you for most of them, except in the last few years, uh, the ones that you picked up then. Um, it, it, do you find it hard to, to to find the discretionary time to actually, you know, enjoy or get into each one of them, or do you like to go in phases? Like now, it is a banjo phase. Do you like getting into that until you've actually, you know, mastered that, or do you like? Uh, do you like to just to play around uh, with with them as in you know whatever mood strikes you? Well, I I find if I don't have them out where I see them, um, I'm not going to play that many of them. And uh, <laughs> recently, you know, with the setup I have, I I just don't have all my guitars out. And really, for the last couple of years, I've mainly been playing uh, the one guitar I didn't mention, which is a, a Chet Atkins uh, Country Gentleman, and. Uh, I love that guitar. Oh, it's a beautiful yeah. instrument. It sounds great. Well, it's to me, it's the only electric I've had where I can do finger style guitar on it. Yeah, and uh, I can take whatever I, I learn on that and go right to the acoustic and play it. And uh, that's I never had a, an electric like that. Yeah, uh, it, it just has the feel of an acoustic guitar. Uh, when you're doing finger style, and you can you can go right to the it's a little harder when you go to the acoustic play yeah. it, but uh, so it's nice when you're learning something that's difficult. I learn it on that first, and then uh, and then you know then then it's not so hard to to pick it up on the uh, acoustic. Yeah. Well, I know for a fact that, that you started off with a pretty much a rock and roll background, then you got into the West Montgomery Chet Atkins yeah. approach, and so. So let's start at the beginning, man. Where, you know, when did you really start getting into playing, uh, and you know, what really tripped your trigger at that time? <clears throat> well, I got really interested in, in guitar music and guitar playing when I was about eight, and uh, my next door neighbor was a friend of mine, and I think we were in third grade together. His father had a nice stereo system you know we called them in those days <laughs> uh, and uh he had a bunch of chet atkins records and uh so we would play those and i wasn't playing the guitar then but we had one in the house that my my brother played and i think it was an old stella acoustic uh but when i heard chet atkins play at, you know at that early age i just i had no idea what he was doing i mean it was uh, sounded like you know two three guitar players. I think one of the first songs I heard was Arkansas Traveler. Which yeah, is, is a solo song. I don't know if you've ever heard that. But, I have. Uh, it's excellent. Yeah, it, it is. still is excellent. <laughs> In fact, uh, I've got all the parts of playing that down. I've just never put it all together. In one take yet. <laughs> oh man, well that that that's a worthwhile session right there, really. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it, a lot of people really don't understand not only the depth of his playing, but also the depth of his production. Oh, he was yeah. a huge influence on so many people. Well, he was uh, somebody that um, you could turn the radio on and hear him. Yeah. You know? I yeah. mean, who could you hear nowadays when you turn the radio on? And maybe your show, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. But, yeah, but I mean, back then, instrumentals were, were part of actually the pop scene. I mean, there, there were groups that had instrumentals on the radio, but uh, and not so today. So I, I, I know that you took some time away from school and went up to Northern Virginia and hung out and uh, got into some rock and roll with uh, with some folks. Um, 
Uh, was that just part of the evolution, or was that just a wild hair you just felt like you really needed to, to take care of at the time? Well, when I was 11, my parents bought me a guitar, and um, mainly because my best friend at that time was somebody you know, Greg Ferris. Oh, yeah. And, uh, he had a, a Chet Atkins a Tennessean, and he was taking lessons from the Greg School of Music. And uh, so anyway, I had to do what Greg was doing. <laughs> they bought me a guitar. <laughs> it was not a very good one, but, you know, it, and a little amp. And so at 13 and 14 is when I really started playing. Yeah. You know? but, but Greg wasn't around long after that. And uh, so he and his parents moved to Washington. And uh, I ended up um, playing in a little garage band. Uh, I call it that. <laughs> Because we practice in a garage all the time. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and we we actually did. I mean, I was 13. Our lead singer was 16. He could drive a car, you know. Um, but he actually had a pretty good voice. I think the rest of us were bad. But uh, we played at uh, pool parties and uh, team dances. Yeah. Because you know, we weren't old enough to get in the clubs. So. Yeah. <laughs> but that was my extent of... Uh, of really performing in uh, in public for ba in a band, uh, and uh, then f really from the age of fourteen to nineteen, I kind of just dropped it, you know, and didn't really start back up again um, until I got to Virginia Tech and I bought a Telecaster up there my freshman year. Got serious, know, and, man. Yeah, and got a big big amp, and you know, we played with some guys. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> those people that I was playing with at Tech, they ended out, most of them ended out dropping out and going to Boyce, Virginia. And, uh, and I followed them a couple quarters later. And we lived on a, a farmhouse and, you know, played music and uh, had, had outdoor things where people would come. But uh, uh, did, you, did you reconnect with Greg up there? Because, you know, Greg had his group happy with Denny Smith and... The rest of those guys. Did you did you ever have a chance to cross paths with him up there? Uh, no, not in Boyce, Virginia. Just in at Virginia Tech, I, I saw Greg's band play. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, they, they were they were good. Yeah, they were. Yeah. <laughs> they're the only they're the only people uh, ever that actually did a uh, professionally published uh, uh, cover of one of my tunes. They did Professional Back Roseman on yeah. their on their album, which I, I, I was just taken by that. They, and they did a, they had such great vocals. They did a really really good rock version of that. In fact, my brother Tom was their manager for a while. Really? Oh, yeah. You didn't know that? No, I no, didn't he, know that. He got him gigs down here at the beach, and uh, yeah, he. Yeah, he's a businessman. <laughs> <man. laughs> he's always been really supportive yeah. of the music too, all the way around, all the way around, man. No doubt about it. But the the boys Virginia thing didn't last too long. I was only there about three or four months, and then I, I went home to uh, you know finish up at Old Dominion. Uh, but and that's when I started playing with uh, you and Steve. Uh, is that is that when you got the one seventy five? Because I I don't know what 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 the time was <laughs> that, where that transition was. Uh, we weren't playing a lot of those songs at Stevie's place, but at your place, um, we had like you know can't get it right, uh, Blue Day run around. Uh, um, a lot of really great, uh, you know, State of Repair, right, uh, right. you know, uh, Desert Night, all those songs that uh, I actually, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say, I, I was really actually getting really into playing the rhythm with those kinds of chords. And when we when we got away from that, uh, I haven't gone back to that since. <laughs> I guess maybe when I unloaded my 335 uh, for an acoustic guitar, that, that was maybe yeah. a, a real big thing. But um, I really enjoyed that period of music that we had there. Well, you 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 uh, always had a really good sense of rhythm, and uh, I could show you those jazz chords, and it wasn't long before you, uh, you know, created the backbone of the songs we were doing. Yeah, but I, I tell you, you know, it was it was exciting. Uh, and the neat thing, what to me about it was, is that that was a a, a really a form of music that I I could share with you and Steve. I mean, completely and totally just us. Now, Tommy Lavin came in. And, you know, Tommy was such an awesome bass player anyway. He he basically slid into the syndrome for a while, and we recorded at your place. Yeah. But, you know, that was, you know, 
that was a, a, a Steve Todd and Tom thing. I mean, you know, it, it, I didn't expect to ever perform any of that, but I damn sure enjoyed, uh, you know, getting into the nuances that those chords actually, you know, give you. And, uh, you know, just it, plus you had, uh, you know, you carried on the tradition of having a four channel sound on sound there so yeah. we could actually capture that stuff. And, and keep it for posterity, whether or not we were going to, you know, take it to CD level quality or not, which is great. Yeah, my old my old dough quarter. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the poor man's uh, T Yeah. Yeah, but but it worked. Yeah. I mean, I, I still I, I still have those those recordings, and every once in a while, I'll go back to them, and I, I I've been really seriously considering trying to, you know, in the in the next I want to finish this EP that I'm working on, but the next one just. Actually, just sticking to the stuff that's already there. I mean, I, I have new songs coming all the time, but we have a ton of yeah. really good material, and we're so much further along the line, down the line, as far as musicianship is concerned. Uh, I think I could really create some really great, uh, some really great fundamental uh, rhythm uh, section stuff for that, that we could have a, ourselves a really good time. Yeah, I mean, you know, I still enjoy the the vocals, and there's uh, also Stevie and I now have the ability to. Uh, harmonize a little better than we did back in those days. So yeah. I think that could be, I think it'd be a lot of fun. But um, uh, what is it that, that actually, was it just listening to Wes Montgomery or what, was it just the, the sound of the instrument or, you know, what was it that actually took you down that road? Um, I think I uh, just started listening to all kinds of guitar music, you know, and, uh, you know, country, classic, classical, blues, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you went through a heavy Django period, too, yeah, man. Yeah, I did, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I can remember, you turned me on to, to Django, but by the time you turned me on to Django, you already had the charts for this guy. <laughs> I mean, you know, you had the, the individual, you know, somebody charted his individual yeah. notes, which was like... Incredible, you know, because that man's all over the place. But um, you know, that was a that was a big plus for me because that also not only uh, opened up that thing for us, but also it kind of kind of reminded me a little bit of the way Cam used to play. He was he was pretty out there in terms of his uh, his pick work, and sometimes it's not a little Django-ish, you know, at times. Well, well Chet Atkins said that um, Django taught the world how to play guitar, and uh, so if any, if you've never heard Django or, you know, heard of him. Uh, he made music in the late 30s and early 40s uh, that'll blow your socks off. And uh, it, you can listen to him and you go, oh, that's where that lick came from, you know. It's, <laughs> I mean, we're talking the late 30s here, so. It's amazing how they got those recordings, too. Yeah. I mean, those kind of like hanging on a spring <laughs> microphone kind of things that they use. It, 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 they were really yeah. serious into, you know, since they didn't have that many mics to position, very difficult to record, uh, uh, they had it, it was either get it in the first take or you didn't get it. Exactly. And yeah. it was it was amazing to listen to those guys play. Yeah, all all the old recordings. Uh, you know, you got to imagine it was one take. Everybody getting it right. <laughs> That's right, man. Well, I got I, I had a, a, a interview with Joanna uh, the other day, and she and her her uh, quartet went on tour with Tommy. Uh, and Tommy's a nice intersection point for us, too, because yeah. uh, we saw him at the church together, and then you treated me, without a doubt, to one of the great concert pleasures of my life. When we went to see him at, what's it called, The Barn, over in Hampton, oh, Newport yeah. News, yeah. you got us front row, in yeah. the middle seats, I mean, six feet away from this guy, and I, I, that was one of the most enjoyable times, uh, as far as live performance, that I've ever had. Um, I, I, I kind of got a, gotten away from it a little bit because there's been so much else going on, especially with the new artists I hear on the station. But at the end of the day, what a great inspiration he is in terms of, you know, what he does. And he, do you know that he can't read a lick of music? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And who did he listen to when he was seven years old? He just listened to Chad. Yeah, it did. <laughs> I mean, you know, so it, 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 you know, it has a way of, you know, this holistic thing going on, I guess. Um, let me ask you this. Outside of those guys uh, in the rock vein, um, who were the people that you really felt like uh, you know, were worth you know, spending time listening to guitar-wise? Oh, yeah. When I was, you know, just, um, I guess, when I got to college, you know, I loved Jimi Hendrix, you know, Clapton. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
a lot of the blues players, you know, I listened to. Uh, but Clapton and Hendrix were a big influence in, until I started listening to uh, jazz. You know. And then, then it was Montgomery and Benson and Joe, yeah. pa- Joe Pass. I remember we were we were pretty high on George Benson for a long time. Uh, I really enjoyed his songs. Uh, when he came out and actually started singing, uh, that just really... You know, I, I never realized that he could be that that complete a musician until he actually got into the vocals. But his his guitar work was was really awesome. Always enjoyed listening yeah. to him. Uh, yeah, he and Chet <clears throat> made some records together too. They did. Yeah, I didn't know that. It's a, I don't think they they did recordings together. Yeah. <clears throat> well, with all the instruments and stuff that you got, man. I mean, I know that you. Uh, uh, You've been at it uh, well as long as me and Steve have, as far as just staying in touch with it. Um, do you feel like it, you come from so many different places uh, as far as the different styles that you say? Do you feel like maybe you're you're hitting on a style of your own, which I think you know I hear it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I do. You know, you you uh, you you listen to other people, but you know you're not going to copy them, no. and uh, you're going to uh, hear they the way they do something, and then you're just going to do it the way that you can. You know, maybe you can't do it exactly like they do, or yeah. or maybe you can do it another way and do it better. You know. Well, well, one of the things that we worked on, which I loved, uh, was uh, "You Ain't Never." You did the rhythm track, uh, electric guitar rhythm track for "You Ain't Never." Uh, it has uh, uh, it has a has a rock bass to it, but it also has there's a, a little something to it that. Uh, I, what were you thinking when you actually were creating that? I mean, that there's, there's it's almost it's not Chetty, you know, like like Chet Atkins would play, but there's but there's a there's a bounce to it uh, that that is is rock, but it's it's also much more stylish, I think, well, than rock. Well, the way I'm playing that is a little bit of Chet. It's uh, that's why it's it, although it's a, a typical rock, you know, yeah, boogie woogie rhythm, right? Yeah, uh, but it's uh, I'm playing it with my fingers and my thumb. And uh, well, most people would just play all that, play it all with just the pick. Yeah, you know? um, yeah. I'd say that's that's where that comes from. You know, the uh, the the way I'm doing using fingers uh, to do a, a simple rock boogie. You know, yeah. Uh, most people would just hammer that with the pick. You know. Yeah, but that fit hand and glove, man. I mean, when I heard that, and when you you know sent that over to me, said I'm finished with it. Here it is. Um, that was that just fit so perfectly mm-hmm. into the whole scheme of what that song was all about, uh, and uh, I mean I had a, a real basic uh, you know acoustic guitar rhythm, and David and Greg were were hitting on the leads. Uh, that was a hell of a rhythm section. It really was, and it really anchored that song a lot. Those you know Greg and and uh, David had a, a very very nice platform mm-hmm. to play on on that one. There's no doubt about it, man. Yeah, it was a good song.
never decide You ain't never gonna run Till you learn how to glide You ain't never gonna run Let it flow from inside Nothing feels better than catching your stride You ain't never gonna fly With your feet on the ground You ain't never gonna fly If you don't come around You ain't never gonna fly What you'll see is profound Life is made for cruising at the speed of sound You ain't never gonna love If you shut down your heart You ain't never gonna love If you never take part You ain't never gonna love If you don't play it smart Hey, look at me, honey, I'm state of the art Our old stuff. What, what? If you were, if you were going to dig back and 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 pull out a song and start uh, that we had before that you really enjoyed, uh, is there one that really sticks out that you really love? Well, I can't get it right. I I like that. And um, uh, whatever happened to Marlo? Yeah, was Every, that, everyone's looking for Marlo. Everyone's like, yeah, was that the, was that the first song you ever wrote or not? That was that was uh, the. It first, was close, right? <laughs> it, it was it was it was one of the first collaborations that Steve and I had together. Uh, it was um, um, I, I, I really love the walk down intro to that. You know that just kind of set that song off really really well. But uh, Steve was a, a real big inspiration in terms of just uh, just the lyrics uh, uh, and the melody. I didn't have the melody in my, in my head until he actually started banging stuff out on the world of yeah. and uh, it, it just kind of happened. Uh, we worked on that song a lot, and mm-hmm. we worked on that song up up in his attic in in uh, South Nova. But it solidified, uh, I think, uh, over at your place. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where it really all came. Together. Matter of fact, that's where almost all those songs came together. Uh, but yeah, everyone's looking for Marlo. I've always. Uh, uh, I've loved the melody on that. I, I, I think we might have to, if I was going to sing it better, we might have to change the key, maybe just a uh, step or two lower, uh, so I'd be able to handle it, especially the longer notes at the end of, of the uh, of the chorus. But uh, yeah, that's always been a, a really sweet song. Well, do you do you uh, remember the first song you wrote? I do. It, it, it was it was an old. It was way back in, way back when I was in eighth grade um, with Kelly Young. Uh, Brown hair, uh, uh, blue eyes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like, I can't believe how oversimplified it was. You know, it was like three chords and, you know, real simple lyrics. And uh, it wasn't like I was taken with her as, as like, I, I really wish she was my girlfriend. Yeah. But uh, but she was like an inspiration to, to put a romantic line out there. Um, yeah. yeah I, I can, as a matter of fact, the only thing I can remember is the actual first verse, which is the title of the song. So uh, yeah, I mean you know. It, so it, that's not copyright. <laughs> <laughs> no man, it, it, that, it, I, I couldn't even remember the lyrics even to copyright that bad boy. Uh, didn't record it either, but had a good time putting it together with with, with Kelly. I mean, she showed me that that things all things were possible. You know, in terms of, well, you know, I can get together with somebody and and actually put something together and have some fun with it. 
Uh, a lot of people don't have that good of a first shot, so I, I was really, you know, pretty lucky with that. What was the first one you copyrighted? The first song I copyrighted? Oh, Was it professional, back road track? Well, it was either that or, well, no, it would have to be something off the Songsmith album. It was probably uh, Pimmobile, uh, Mangy Dog Blues. Um, you probably did all those at the same time. Yeah, right? I did. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I did, I did a group copyright for all the... Well, I take that back. I did uh, um, uh, the sound recording I did as a group thing, but each one of those uh, individual songs were uh, were copyrighted, you know, one at a time because mm -hmm. I, I really didn't get into the group copyright thing until I realized, you know, all that stuff that we had done, all the recordings that we had, that stuff, need, even though it's really rough and not exactly where we wanted it to be, that shit needed to be copyrighted. Yeah. I mean, that's ours. Mm -hmm. You know, that's our stuff. So I basically uh, did big ass group copyrights for for those songs, and they didn't have they have a limit of ten songs now. They didn't have that limit back then. I mean, if you could pack it all on a cassette tape, yeah. you know, then you could send the whole thing in and just list all the songs that were there. Which uh, and, and and naming the group, you could give the, uh, the, the the actual copyright group name an individual name that you wanted. Can't do that anymore. Mm. They make you. You know, use one of the songs in the group as the title of the group, and then everything else comes after that. But, uh, but yeah, copywriting was, was a big deal. Uh, and those songs, uh, those songs are all safe. If you ever wanted to, if we ever wanted to actually, you know, get into putting them out there, uh, which I think would be, I think it'd be a great project for us. I mean, we haven't had a project in a while. Um, so just not to get too far off track, tell me how, uh, um, I know you're almost at that stage where you're, where, where you're ready to polish off the actual structural aspects of the studio. So you have some uh, some some basic uh, uh, what uh, sheetrock and and some sound stuff and all the rest of that kind of thing. That it, that would open up a whole new avenue yeah, for yep. us. It's going to happen. Uh, it's taking it one day at a time. I hear you, brother. <laughs> it, it ain't easy. Yeah, I, it ain't easy. It's hard, hard to get the energy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Understood, uh, but you know, the, even even in its stage right now, uh, I remember coming over and working on um, the Paul Simon American tune yeah. in your studio. You had yeah. the uh, what, what was that? Was that a blue? Was the mic that you had? Or, or it was a road or a blue? Ro what, a, uh, uh, we used both mics, right? Yeah, a, a road and um, uh, the other one that you had for a period of time. Which one? Well, I had Stevie's uh, 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 AKG 414. Uh, but the neat thing about that was I love the sound that, that, that uh, your mic had because uh, I, I wanted to get a really nice full acoustic sound, but I wasn't getting really for that solo because it's just my voice and that guitar, and I wanted to, to really to come through. So uh, <clears throat> you said, come on over, let, let, let's use this mic and do it here. Now you did play my Santa Cruz, but I, I'm not sure whether you used that on the uh, in the uh, no, for I, the I, final it, track. No, I didn't that. use it for the final track. But what I did do, which uh, you know, I was I was really pretty proud of the sound of, of the, the clarity of that mic was really so good. I had recorded um, uh, the the actual initial track with Stevie's um, AKG 414, and then on top of that, I had actually placed something right off my pickup. Which was just, you know, to give me something to uh, to maneuver the sound if I needed to. But the thing was, is that, well, you know me and my finger picking, I had to actually play that part, the entire song, exactly the same way, lick for lick, you know, uh, all the way through. So to, to actually get that that fullness, instead of like duplicating tracks or uh, recording them all, I didn't have the, the, the possibility of recording them all at the same time. Yeah. So you got that mic in front of me. I love that, and we did that. So I actually had three identical uh, but separately recorded uh, acoustic guitar tracks, which made all the difference in the world yeah. for that song. That mic brought the clarity of that guitar out so much. Uh, you know, taught me uh, in, in a big way um, how you know. Of course, following the experimental thing that we've <laughs> always been into, uh, how you know, uh, getting a good solid acoustic sound um, was possible now because we, we, we're at that stage where, you know, right now I have uh, I have great mics and great instruments. So do you. So does Stevie. So we're at that stage where we can actually do this. Uh, and, and you know, even though uh, we live pretty close by, uh, Stevie's out, out in the boonies, but uh, 
uh, we could still transfer our stuff, whether it be WAV files or MP3s or our ideas or finished tracks or yeah. single tracks, any way we want to. Which you know that that's the stage uh, that I want us to get at because that that provided the foundation for everything back in the old days when we were working with Stevie's four channel and your four yeah. channel. I mean that we had that process. We had everything down pat. Uh, we had the songs. I mean, how many people have that many really, really good songs to work with like we had uh, and still have? They're just sitting there waiting for us to, to, to take them on, plus whatever new stuff we happen to come up with. It's just so, I mean, it's so promising that in our later years, you know, as we, as we evolve into decrepitude, uh, we still have our skill sets. We can still play. I can still sing. Uh, you know, there's there's so many positives. It's just a matter of, you know, finding the time. And two or two out of three of us are retired. We need to get that other boy out. <laughs> yeah, and get him retired, and we, we'll, you know, we can we can have our lives with our families and everything else. But uh, we can also do our music and, and keep that flow going, which I I really look forward to, man. As years go by, I do. Well, we, I figure we played almost every Sunday. From about Steve, you and I, from about seventy, I'm gonna say maybe seventy four, for about ten years. From oh, there. absolutely, yeah, it was all, yeah, it almost was, every Sunday. Yeah, it was great, and it, you know, they, uh, every once in a while we bring somebody like uh, I don't know if you remember, but over at your place, <laughs> Rob Mickley, yeah. the drummer. You know, he's dead now. He died yeah. several years ago. Uh, but he was a great drummer. We had Rob Mickley in there. Uh, had, uh, John Jelly came over too. That's right. Yeah. Uh, playing the Kungs. And, and John died. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Maybe we have a, a bad effect. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, also Tom Lavin. Tom Lavin. Yeah. You know, there were a lot of people that cruised in and out of those studios uh, that were excellent talents, and we still have that stuff. Some of that, uh, the stuff with Rob uh, and with John, I don't have the recording stuff, but Steve does. But you know, plowing through uh, the, the the archives with Steve might might be you know pretty laborious <laughs> task to take, man. But because uh, he's got so much stuff, does he, does he still have a reel to reel he he can play things on or or not? Well, I think he has a regular reel to reel. The four channel is shot. He'd have to buy have to send that away and get new heads, and also the uh, whatever it is that keeps the the, the tape tight. Yeah. Uh, that, that's busted. Mm. So it, it would have to go away for a while, you know, in order to be able to come back. And, and by the, I, you know, I would, I would venture to say that uh, those tapes are probably pretty flaky <laughs> by now. You know, I know that my, my tapes for um, Calm Before the Storm and for Songsmith, uh, they flaked themselves into oblivion. Uh, many, I mean, you, people say, well, you can, you can go and have them cooked and, you know, you can save the tracks. Well, um, you know, they were, I had a, a session with Steve Peppis at his studio, who who had a a two inch wide analog deck at the at the time, and he was able to save a couple of. Uh, I mean, he he re, he rewound the tape, and as he rewound it, I mean, it was it was snowing in there. I mean, it, stuff was flaking off. It was terrible, and so he said, "You know, Tom, we're only going to have one shot at this," and it was uh, mostly the stuff I had done with Tom Jones. Um, but basically, you know, he said, "Here, you you work in Tom's lead. This is this is the the you know the fader for that. I'll get everything else." And in one shot, we did that. But after it was done, those tapes were the tapes were gone. Yeah. You know, so uh, you know, which is sad. But um, uh, at least from um, over the falls, which is what two thousand and six. From that point on, I have all the tracks, mm -hmm. everything uh, that we've done. And so you know that uh, it, that's 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 nice to have, but man, I miss some of the some of the stuff that uh, uh, that we were able to, to to do. I would love to have the tracks for that back again, really would. I want to I want to ask you if you remember this. <laughs> do you remember after your dad built it, uh, uh, Stephen Todd's dad built this huge gigantic um, workshop? You, you're going to mention the charcoal jam. The charcoal jam. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> this this place was gigantic, and we had we were it was in the winter time, and we were in there, and we had a whole bunch of people that were that were there you know, with their guitars and amps and whatever to jam, and we were freezing our asses off. So what did we do? We got we got the barbecue and put a whole bunch of uh, uh, briquettes in there and heated that boy, bad boy up. Well, about an hour after playing for about an hour hour and a half, 
We literally crawled out of that place because we were dying of carbon monoxide poisoning. It was even though this place was so big, we had filled that place with just you know they had to air it out for a day. Yeah, the 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 drummer was like the canary in the coal mine. He <laughs> he was the first guy to go down. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the passion of the moment, man. I can, I can remember I, I, I had to have somebody drive me back because I crawled out of that and crawled up to your uh, the, the steps to your parents' little sunroom and asked your mother, begged her for something to drink and, and tell it, say, could you call Tanya and have her come pick me up? Or, or can somebody drive me there because there's no way in the world I'm going to be able to make it home? Yeah, we were really not that dumb. I mean, it, it was a really big shop and it, you know, we thought it was well ventilated, and it just, it just wasn't the case. Well, maybe we forgot to turn the exhaust fan on or some shit like that. I mean, that was, but that you know, those kinds of moments uh, are are just part of the, you know, the fun. <laughs> yeah, we we used to have a ton of fun with that stuff. There ain't no doubt about it. But that that was that was a nice moment. Um, I got to know your, especially in the last maybe ten years of their lives. I got to know your mom and dad uh, pretty good. Um, uh, your mom was much more outspoken than your dad was just in general conversation. Oh, yeah. But, but you know, he always, uh, I, he was into so many different things, building the boat, the gyrocopter, yeah. uh, you know, all the different things. How much of an influence was he on you all with just getting into stuff? Um, a lot. Uh, I think uh, learning to work with my hands, you know, I owe it all to him. You know, I, I helped him, you know, do things. But uh, just the way he went about doing things, um, you can learn from that, you know, yeah. how somebody approaches something. And uh, he never did anything without really thinking about it. Oh, know? yeah. I mean, just, you know, any kind of thing with your hands, you know. Uh, he read about it and he thought about it. And uh, he, he, you know, he... He learned to do everything the best way, you know. Well, I, I think the I think building the shop. I, I had a I was I really enjoyed. It. I only had a couple of days when I went over there when you and the rest of the brothers and your dad were working on it. Uh, put in the foundation was the was the part that, yeah. that I was uh, was most present at. <clears throat> uh, after that, I just kind of got you know stories. But uh, the thing that just amazed me uh, was the fact that uh, he he learned how to weld. I mean, mm -hmm. he literally welded a, a steel hull uh, for the twin master schooner that he actually uh, uh, built, and he learned how to, to, to weld in order to be able to do that. That just blew me away. I mean, I knew he was very talented and, and got into a lot of stuff, and he stocked that thing with really great power tools and all the stuff that he needed. But to actually just get the raw steel and just just do it, I mean, you know, with the uh, it's not just putting two pieces together and well. There was there was an art form to actually yeah. putting that together, and he he mastered that in the time that he had that he put that boat together. Well, and then he and my mother basically uh, moved all did all the rigging. They they moved those pieces of some of them were you know eight foot sheets. That, oh yeah. that wrapped around the hull, and I'd come over and they would, had already you know moved it, put it in place, and and started welding it and. Uh, I, <laughs> And I, I'd ask, well, how'd you do that? He said, well, we put a wire up there, you know, wire up here. And, and I got on the ladder and kept moving them. And, you know. <laughs> he also had a, had uh, somebody, uh, uh, an older friend, uh, uh, someone his age, that came by, I think, and, and worked on it with him from time to time. Yeah. But, you know, to, not only to fashion the hull, but also to, he, had, he was uh, great at woodworking. He, he, he designed and cut all the pieces, worked with that teak and stuff to make the interior. And... <laughs> I can remember when they, they took it out of the garage, had that big-ass garage door, and, and took it down to the marina and did some final polishing on it. I remember the first time that uh, I... I uh, this is so me. Uh, first time I went out with you guys on it, which I thought was, you know, really quite an honor. And, of course, first thing I did was, you know, after about a half hour, 45 minutes, I was I was throwing up. I mean, because... <laughs> Because I, you know, I I just get seasick at a drop of a hat, and you guys, you know, I caught a lot of shit for that. But, <laughs> but you know, but what an incredible project, and, and it brought the brought the, the the brothers together. You know, I think that was uh, I think he probably really enjoyed that aspect too. You know, yeah. you know, he built the shop, and for ten years, he collected uh, woodworking equipment. Um, we used it to play badminton a lot in the wintertime because yeah. you know, it had a real high ceiling. And we kind of thought, yeah, 
yeah, he's going to build a sailboat. Yeah, you know, and uh, <laughs> but and, and so I, like I say, he he read and he planned for ten years, and then it, then he built the boat in about ten years, you know, completely. So. You know, it was a long project. Well, I I can remember going over and hanging out with Steve uh, from time to time. Uh, he'd be in, in the uh, the den uh, watching TV, and I, it's it's the little things. He was the first person. He said, "Come here, I want to show you something." So I walked into the kitchen with him, and he had his cup of coffee in his hand. He said, "I want to show you something. This is this is called a microwave." He was the first guy on his block to have one, and he said he said he said you know. Feel this cup. I felt it. He sucked it there, sucked it there for a minute, brought it back out, and it was pretty toasty. Yeah. I, I said, man, that is that is awesome. He was the first person that I ever saw use a microwave for anything, and he was using it to warm up his coffee. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, he was always also ham radio, yeah. you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, always into something interesting, always great for a good conversation, man. What a guy. What a guy. Yeah, I miss him. Yeah, I know. Yeah. He, uh, he also was over at Bay Lake. Yeah, uh, my dad was over there. My mom was over there. So uh, that that's a kind of a, I guess you could say a location that holds a, a lot of a lot of memories, so to speak. Well, to to bring it back to the guitar, you know, my dad was a big Chet Atkins fan. Really? And, yeah. And uh, when he bought me that first guitar, you know, I, I was eleven. He said, you know, you had to learn to play like Chet. And I said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I didn't know what Chip was doing. I had no, I, you know, I wanted to be, you know, play like the Beatles or whatever, you know. Yeah. But that far back, you know, I said I listened to him because I didn't really want to play like Chet until you know years later. Uh, <laughs> so that, but he used to, um, I'd get a call, you know, be eight o'clock, nine thirty at night, and he'd say. Hey, go to channel fifteen. Chet's on there, and uh, and I do the same. I do the same to him. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, when he was at Bay Lake, was when I got one of my last calls from him about, um, you know, he was only there two months before he passed away. But yeah. when he was there, he called me and told me somebody was playing on. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I think both of us realized that, you know, we came from. From really good stock, we had good parents, and they supported. It and they, I think, they not only supported it and encouraged us, but I think that at the end of the day, we actually finally started doing something. Could actually play something for them, or they could hear yeah. a recording. I think there was a, a certain amount of ownership and pride that yeah. they had in that. You know, I truly do. Um, and because uh, you know, uh, the conversations, uh, at least the last ones that I had with them, were, were focused mostly on what's what Steve and you and me were doing. Uh, he, I said, he said, well, we all going to put out a record. I said, well, you know, <laughs> it, it takes a while, but yeah, we're, we're working on it. it. It's an ongoing process, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, he did hear you. I know he, I know he, uh, I played his, your first CD for him. Yeah. He was still alive then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, let me ask you, there are a lot of other people that crossed our paths. Uh, do you ever, uh, hear from Danny anymore? Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, He's still playing, you know, still playing. Still, really? Still has his guitars, yeah. But it's it's been about three years, three or four years since I've talked to him. Yeah. But he was he was he was always really really kind, uh, and uh, he he uh, that's one connection that we had that uh, you you introduced me to him. He did one of the nicest things. Uh, he actually took a picture of me while I was playing solo at Reisner's. And uh, it, was, it was a high quality picture, and he had it blown up to like a poster size. Is that right? Yeah, and gave it to me. Uh, I still have it. it. It's in the closet. I haven't, I haven't ever really uh, framed it. Uh, I need to, because it, it it's uh, it, it 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 was just it was like out of the blue. Like why would you do that for me except for just being a nice guy? Yeah, you know. So, uh, but he also he was a pretty good player. Yeah, this is uh, a friend of mine, Danny Charles, that uh, we're talking about. Now. Yeah. So I mean, you know, there there have been uh, it also uh, another great intersection uh, uh, heart player, uh, Jim Cummins. No. You know, uh, Jim uh, has a, a really strong presence on the on the Songsmith album, um, and you 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 got back together with Greg. I mean, you know, on uh, Snow Dance, right, right. You got that lead down pat, uh, and so uh, matter of fact, you all dueled. Uh, you know, what what, what yeah, you we had a harmony part. Yeah, yeah. harmony part yeah. together. Harmony lead, yeah, yeah. Which I which I have always really you know there's there's something about that that uh, I've always been you know really kind of. I've been really proud of the fact that that we were able to get that kind of sound. Uh, it's not something that we could have performed because we just didn't have the personnel uh, or or the or the band to actually make that happen. 
But uh, I've always been proud of that song because yeah. uh, because you guys were the ones who actually uh, laid down the the I guess you could say that did the heavy lifting on that one, and that that worked out to be really really good.
Okay, I got I got to ask you. You asked me about my first song. What was the first song that you ever you know learned from start to finish? I mean, you know, on the guitar. Can you remember that? Hmm. Well, I mean, we want to get basic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think the yeah, first the first lead I ever learned, you know, uh, was Louie Louie. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, Greg taught it to me. Well, I, I guess that was like the. Well, what do you know how to play song whenever you got together with people? If you didn't know that, you were up Shit's Creek. <laughs> I, uh, I never really had the chance to, to do any jamming band-wise. I always, uh, like Robbie Turner, uh, bless his heart, he had a set of drums. And of course, I started out on drums. And he had him and his brother Richard and, and Tim Temple and I forget who was playing bass. They all would go over in his garage, and I, I, when they went to take a break, I would bang on Robbie's drums just to see what it's like to play on a full set. But uh, uh, to have that 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 kind of you know cohesiveness of, or trying to put things together with people in a band, I didn't have that for the longest time. But you almost started off that way. Yeah, when I was thirteen, uh, I was in that band, and Tim Temple was there and Terry O'Brien was the the 16 year old guy who had the car as a matter of fact if anybody knows where Terry O'Brien is lived in Windsor Woods I'd, I'd like like to hear about him because uh, <laughs> never been able to f- figure out what happened to him <laughs> so let me ask you man um where where do you, do you like you know as far as the way things are evolving now in terms of your your recording and your playing and all this that stuff yeah, do you have any like uh, uh, I guess you could say objectives or goals you want to hit? You know, like say in the next five or ten years or I, anything. I do. Yeah, I, I I play as much as I want to. Yeah, and but I'd like to want to play more. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, and I do want to I do want to do a CD of you know mainly solos and some co- collaborations too you know hopefully with you guys but i, oh, I yeah i do want to do a cd and i you know i don't have a lot of original songs i, I i'll you know i'll cover other songs i mean i i just i just like doing good arrangements and playing them well oh and, yeah uh, so I, yeah i do want to do a cd you know well stevie's on the same track too he's got we got um sinking feeling done uh he's got um let me see uh, if I could and uh, catch me when I fall, those are the next ones. And he's got a couple other songs that are really on the way, way back burners. Yeah. But there's enough for an EP there. Um, of course, his discretionary time being a mailman is like non-existent. Yeah, you know. So uh, uh, especially with the with the way COVID has been, and and you know, summer is always rough because of the heat. So I mean, you know, uh, he sends me. He does. He stays up with it. I mean, he's up with his boomerangs and all the other stuff he has that, uh, as far as interest. But he stays up with it. He puts pieces together. He's got a vocal part now uh, that he wants to send me that uh, that he says he's really really happy with, uh, which I'm really. He, he's going to get it in the mail to me, not in the mail. He's yeah. going to he's going to shoot it to me through uh, Dropbox, and so we still collaborate. I, I would, yeah. Hope you don't mind me saying this, man. But uh, I, I really look forward to the day yeah. uh, when the three of us have that studio. Th- that what well, have that, it, it, you know, just that that ability, you know, to uh, if we want to concentrate for an hour, if we want to concentrate for five hours, uh, we can do it, yeah. you know, and and be able to swap that off and, uh, and share the ideas and get that synergy going again. It's it's important. It's it was so much a part of. So much a part of us in the beginning, and we've all evolved and stayed, you know, stayed with with uh, with writing and playing and recording and having the equipment that we need to get where we want to be. Yeah. And we're right now we're at that stage. Uh, I, I I look forward to the time when we. I mean, when we get together as a threesome, that's that's always a ton of fun. But you know, when we're in our own studios, uh, we can go to his. You can come over here to mine. We can go to yours. That uh, you know, and in the meantime, be able to record the tracks the way that we want to using good equipment, and then piece it all together. Yeah. You know, to be like coming full circle. That's yeah. right, man. It, it's exactly right. <laughs> it's exactly it's exactly what it is, and uh, it feels good. It always has, uh, always will. Um, I just uh, yeah, I, I love the situation that we that we've evolved into. I just look look forward to where we can have even more of it. You know, as as we get older and a little bit wiser about how to do this stuff. Yeah. So let me see, man. I guess you could say as a, as a parting note, um, 
just, well, I, I, I don't even have a parting note. I'm just so glad that you were here, yeah. you know, I, that we had this time to actually go waltz down memory lane a little bit, especially pulling in the stuff about family because a lot of people uh, don't realize uh, that there's a, a real strong family connection there. I guess maybe of all the other brothers and stuff, uh, Tommy would be the one that would be uh, the, the most directly involved with uh, – uh, keeping up with our music, yeah. whether you know it's our original stuff or anything that I'm doing performing, uh, uh, you all have been there through thick and thin, and uh, it's it's been one of the, the best, I guess you could say, overall uh, relationships and friendships of my entire life. Uh, and I just look forward to us having the time to to do what we want and uh, still have fun together, brother. I'm looking forward to it. You know, you've had a uh, you had a great career without Steve and I, uh, yeah, you know, but, uh, but you know, <laughs> it'd be nice to come full circle. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, because there's, there's a history there and the history is not only built on, on, on you know, uh, experimental music and stuff. We have a catalog of incredibly good songs, which, uh, you know, now that we're into, uh, uh, having a really positive home studio situation, I think that that in and of itself uh, will give us a chance to uh, to put it all together and get your CD out and get yeah. Stevie's CD out and uh, and therefore you know, have uh, I guess you could say to archive the sound uh, and share it with the public and most of the stuff we, we share with our, each other but uh, I think that there's some really really great music and, and really good lyrics and stuff that we can share with the rest of the world and man I just look forward to doing it it's too much fun not to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I appreciate you having me here today, Tom. Well, brother, what can I say, Todd? I love you, man, and I, I look forward to us uh, having many good years together. I do. Me too. This episode was produced by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick, edited and mixed by Alton Riddick for Edit Your Truth. On behalf of Tom... This is Alton signing off until we meet again on The Path Taken. Mm -hmm.